This is a 100% independent, non-corporatized, fresh air activist news show, and we want to keep it that way. So to help us keep acting out, visit patreon.com slash act out and become a patron. This week, from the military occupation of Puerto Rico to the sick reality show Courtship of Amazon, we've got some headlines that you may not have heard about but need to know about. Next up, Big Brother is watching you, but you can still find ways of accessing the internet without turning the spotlight on. Finally, we talked to Mind's co-founder Bill Ottman about free speech, hate speech, and the hopeful rise of alternatives in a Facebook-dominated age. From tweets to marching in the streets, this is Act Out. Welcome to ACT OUT, I'm Eleanor Goldfield and this is your Tipping Point. Getting us started today, here are some headlines that you might have missed but need to know about, and I'm trying to lessen the blow by giving you a lovely autumnal scene. You may recall back in episode 130 that volunteer disaster relief specialist Bobby Rodrigo outlined some pitfalls of the federal response to hurricanes in Texas, Florida, and Puerto Rico. Be it FEMA turning away aid, Red Cross turning away doctors, or actual roadblocks stopping people from coming into disaster zones, despite the fact that they are bringing aid, our government's main concern does doesn't seem to be the safety and rebuilding of affected communities. And last week, that point was made just a bit clearer. Masked men armed with rifles, extra ammo, guns, knives, and arrest zip ties were seen around San Juan, patrolling the streets in army fatigues with no markings or ID outside of the word contractor. While it's unclear who these men work for, everyone's favorite batshit mercenaries, made famous for massacres in Iraq, got several calls to throw their particular brand of murderous asshole with a rifle into the mix. U.S. security firm Academy, formerly called Blackwater, has received at least five different requests for help, including one from Federal Protective Services, which is part of the Department of Homeland Security. A job listing on the Constellus website says that they're looking for security professionals to deploy to Puerto Rico to provide humanitarian and armed security services. One of the tasks would be dealing tactfully with the general public. Hmm, like how they tactfully dealt with the Iraqis that they slaughtered? What could go wrong? Make a note, my fellow Americans, mercenaries bring aid, volunteer disaster relief workers, the... fuck them. Moving on, Energy Transfer Partners and their subsidiary Sunoku continues to bully landowners and contaminate water. You may recall from our coverage in episode 125 that the only things that Sunoco and ETP can consistently get right are their harassment of landowners and activists and the destruction of land, water, and air. In this case, much like in the Gerhardt's case, which we also covered in episode 125, Sunoco cleared trees after seizing the Bloom's land via eminent domain. As construction continued, the Bloom's water began to smell odd and burn their eyes and faces if they used it. At this point, iron contamination has also eaten through pipes in the Bloom's house, cutting off all indoor plumbing. Meanwhile, Sunoco's response to the Bloom's claim that they contaminated the water? Prove it, or we won't pay you anything. A bold thing to say to, the only, to only the latest in a long string of landowners who have suffered water contamination along the Mariner East 2 pipeline construction route. Having suffered 90 spills in 42 locations of the pipeline's construction, it doesn't appear that Sunoco has much of a defense to hide behind. But in Pennsylvania, they don't need it. He, Ralph Bloom, has reached out to the DEP and governor about the water contamination and asked his county legislators and state representative to do something. He lives only about 30 miles from the state capital in Harrisburg, but so far the state government hasn't shown any signs of caring about what's happened. They're pro-pipeline, so is the local government. America, the oil company with an army. Moving on, a recent 60 Minutes investigation highlights the statements of a former DEA agent who says that the opioid crisis was allowed to spread, aided by Congress, lobbyists, and a drug distribution industry that shipped, almost unchecked, hundreds of millions of pills to rogue pharmacies and pain clinics, providing the rocket fuel for a crisis that over the last two decades 
has claimed 200,000 lives. Joe Bernasisi outlines the insane inside story detailing how Big Pharma effectively ignored DEA attempts to manage the opioid craze while lobbying Congress to get the DEA off their backs and make lax already toothless regulations. Add to that money flowing directly to top DEA lawyers in the revolving door, and the pain pill craze is allowed to continue unabated. Finally, last week, cities across the U.S. competed in embarrassingly depraved ways to host Amazon's second headquarters. From lighting up New York City in orange to the mayor of Kansas City, reviewing a thousand Amazon products with five-star reviews, to kids in Philadelphia writing pitches of their city to Amazon's CEO as a goddamn homework assignment. This is what the corporate bachelor reality show looks like. Henry Graber, staff writer for Slate, shared his blatant disgust for this sycophantic behavior while pointing out the devastating effects for both small businesses and the average taxpayer. For example, this year alone, Amazon has enjoyed $177 million in corporate welfare from the government, a whopping $1.2 billion in subsidies since its founding. Meanwhile, it's responsible for shuttering 135 million square feet of retail which wouldn't be as horrendous if the economy would make up for lost jobs and livelihoods rather than pay Amazon billions of dollars for treating its workers in such brutal ways as to best the infamous Walmart. Including beyond Orwellian surveillance and tracking tactics, brutal working conditions where extreme heat and cold are common, few or no breaks to even use the bathroom, and intimidation techniques if and when any complaints are made. I could totally see why you'd want that in your town, which is, of course, just the point. You don't. But the flimsy facade of 50,000 jobs and billions in investment makes mayors across the country jizz themselves in excitement. So more people will enter the exploited worker ranks, city officials will get payouts, prime memberships, and establishment kudos, and the downward spiral towards socioeconomic devastation will continue. So if you'd rather not see your city, your friends, and perhaps even yourself standing in the stagnant air of an Amazon warehouse, check bit.ly slash Amazon HQ2 list to see if your city made a bid and then get some people together to fight it. We don't want Amazon in our cities, our towns. We don't want Walmart. We don't want any vampiric corporations that use our lives as lubricant in a sick capitalist machine. Take a stand for your community and against low-life scum. You low-life scum. Moving on to our main story today, imagine a police state so bent on repressing dissent that people were targeted by the government just for visiting a web page or liking a page on Facebook. This dystopian scenario is not science fiction, and it isn't something happening in a far-off country. It's happening here in the U.S. No, really. Let's take a look at a recent example. On an auspicious Friday the 13th in October, the federal government dropped its demand that Facebook turn over information about anyone who had simply liked a page dedicated to protesting Donald Trump's inauguration. In this case, three warrants were served that demand Facebook provide the U.S. government with all information from the accounts of two activists and a page affiliated with massive protests against right-wing President Donald Trump's inauguration on January 20th. The requested information includes the entirety of photos, videos, posts, private messages, video calls, billing information, and other data between November 1st, 2016 and February 9th, 2017. If successful, the warrant for Disrupt J20 could result in 6,000 visitors to that page having their names and public and private activity on and with the page passed on to government. And while it wasn't successful, this isn't the first time that the feds have tried to target anyone who'd even looked up information on the massive J20 protests, as Gizmodo reported. The case is the second known attempt by the DOJ to collect large swaths of data about people who participated in the January 20th protests. The DOJ also demanded that web hosting company DreamHost hand over the IP addresses of 1.3 million visitors to an anti-Trump website, disruptj20.org. Eventually, dropped the request for the IP logs and had the scope of its warrant further narrowed by a judge. 
While the government was forced down when challenged by groups like the ACLU and Cyber Liberty's watchdog EFF, this was still a clear and chilling attempt to silence even the most basic forms of dissent. And it's almost certain that we haven't seen the last of this sort of thing. Keep in mind that dozens of people arrested for protesting the inauguration are still facing up to seven and a half decades in jail. And we can only guess at the horrors that Cheeto Gestapo might have unleashed with access to just a little bit more information about his opponents. And if you think that this all sounds horribly Orwellian, it does. As we covered last week, the behemoths of the internet world are already funneling our news into ever smaller echo chambers. But on top of that, those echo chambers are fully equipped with surveillance systems beyond your wildest imagination. Surveillance systems that aren't just there to sell you shoes that they know you like, but to sell the government information on what shoes you wear, where you bought them, and where they're walking to right now. Just think about all the power that, a, that corporations can have by knowing what you search for online, where you go, and even what books you read. And the worst part of it is, we usually don't stop to think about it. Most of us have handed over a staggering around, amount of information, all in the name of a little bit of convenience. Fortunately, there are some pretty, pretty simple ways that we can reclaim our online privacy, or at least make our fascist rulers work just a little harder to spy on us. In today's connected society, all of us are on the front lines when it comes to resisting mass surveillance, and today we'll give you a small toolkit that'll help you take your privacy back. So how can we protect ourselves from both a fascist re regime and unscrupulous profit and power hungry companies? One of the first and simplest steps to take is to simply change how you search. As I mentioned last week briefly, DuckDuckGo is a search engine which uses the same database as Google, but it doesn't log your searches. You can easily access it on any web browser, even get an app for your phone. While we're on, to on the topic of Google actually, if you're using Chrome, don't. Switch to Firefox or even Opera, both of which protect their users' privacy more and probably work better too since Chrome has long since gone from the leanest, meanest browser to a sad stumbling piece of bloatware. And you should never log into your browser. Even though it makes it a little easier to access web pages from one device to another, you're also leaving a very distinct trail that links your devices to your desktop to everything you read online. As for email, a great alternative to Gmail, especially for activists, is ProtonMail. This email service not only protects your account with the usual username and password, but your inbox is fully encrypted, unlocked with a second password, creating one of the safest email options around. While a basic account is free, for a small annual fee, you can also get more storage and the ability to send unlimited emails. I talked a bit about the importance of encryption back in episode 105, where I introduced viewers to the encrypted messaging app Signal, which replaces not just your text messaging app, but can also make encrypted phone calls. Another important step that you can take to protect yourself online is to make use of a virtual private network, or VPN, which adds another layer between your internet service provider and whatever sites that you visit, making your activities that much harder to track. There are dozens of VPN providers, but you'll want to sign up with a service that is located in a foreign country that doesn't collaborate to share surveillance information with the United States and doesn't keep logs of users' activities. A good VPN probably not, won't be free, but there are lots of inexpensive options. When you're shopping for a VPN, it's a good idea to search, using DuckDuckGo by the way, if they've ever been forced to provide user logs in a court case. For example, the service PureVPN claims that it doesn't keep user logs, but was recently forced to admit that they had helped the FBI catch a cyberstalker by, you guessed it, providing the feds with the user data that was supposedly non-existent. You can find a great comparison guide to VPN providers by visiting this bitlink, bit.ly slash VPN compare. You can also get some great VPN recommendations along with other security tips from our friends at the Oh Shit What Now Collective in Austin, Texas. Go to bit.ly slash oh shit privacy. And if all of this sounds complicated and a pain in the ass, don't get overwhelmed. A good VPN will have instructions and an app to help you set up their service on both your computer and your phone. 
And this now brings us to the thorny topic of social media. One tempting option is just to cut the cord and quit using sites like Facebook and Twitter entirely, entirely, and just go back to, you know, talking to people. But whether you're a content creator like me or someone who wants to keep in touch with people that are thousands of miles away, you don't have to settle for mass surveillance. One alternative that's growing in popularity is Mastodon, which will be easy to remember for all of you metalheads out there. Mastodon, the social media site, is a unique decentralized open source social network. Instead of everything being located on a single central website like Facebook does, Mastodon users can create their own communities like miniature social networks that can then be linked up to other Mastodon networks using servers run by Mastodon or other servers. This allows more control over content and with the help of pointed anti-abuse tools makes it easier to isolate and kick off trolls and Nazis, which was a primary catalyst for starting the network. In fact, when you create a Mastodon account, you actually get to choose whether you'd like to join a server that allows sexism, racism, hate speech, spam, ads, etc. Set up to emulate Twitter more so than Facebook, Mastodon has a thousand character limit so as to allow for a little more eloquence and delivers posts in chronological order minus any ads or restricting algorithms. Founder Eugen Rochko originally didn't think it would garner the 700,000 plus users that it currently boasts, but admits, I think more people than I thought are looking to quit commercial social networks. They're tired of being treated like the product instead of the customer. Rochko's sentiment echoes that of Mind's co-founder, Bill Ottman, who co-founded the social media site back in 2015. Mind's is a bit more of the Facebook feel compared to Mastodon, complete with direct video upload tools, groups, blogs, and monetization options. Both Mind's and Mastodon are based on open source, decentralized networking that prioritizes user privacy and experience. Two things that corporate social media waved bye-bye to a long time ago, if they ever even had it. And while Mastodon was founded with direct nods towards the issue of Twitter not banning fascists, Minds takes on a more relaxed stance. While you can report posts as harassment, bullying, or inciting violence, no accounts will be taken down unless they violate U.S. law. The question then, of course, becomes whether a website banning certain things is synonymous with a government doing so. Fascists are obviously still allowed to spew their bigoted, dumb shittery, but is allowing them to do so on your platform necessary? And if not, should you? And if you don't, where do you draw the line? Holocaust denial, inciting violence towards blacks or people of color? Tricky questions, and ones, among others, that I sat down with Mind's co-founder Bill Ottman last week to discuss. Take a look. So now Facebook is the largest social media site in the world with 2 billion monthly users. And as we just mentioned, it's also rife with surveillance. Uh, and we also talked about in a previous episode how uh, the algorithms filter bubble and dictate what fake news is based on, uh, on the two-party paradigm. Talk about uh, th the structure of minds and, and what kind of algorithms you use or how do you, how do you deal with the idea of filter bubbling, but also how... And if you deal with any sort of like fake news or, or anything like that. Yeah, those are awesome questions. I mean, so with fake news, basically our stance is that people should decide what is real and what is not. We don't think that there should be AI and algorithms dictating what people see and what people consider to be true. I mean, honestly, read it for yourself, like learn how to check sources, learn, understand the peer review process. And, you know, letting other people tell you what's real does not make sense. Um, in terms of algorithms, so we, our newsfeed is 100% organic reach. What Facebook has done over the last handful of years is restrict their organic reach. So now a, a fan page with, say, you know, 100,000 fans is only going to be reaching around 3% of those fans naturally and organically. They want you to pay to reach more. I mean, this is the antithesis of what a social network is about. So now algorithms are not inherently bad as options. So say you wanted a different option that was suggested based on what you're interacting with. And yeah, that would be a little bit of an echo chamber. But, you know, there's there's also interesting things algorithms can do to potentially uh, help you. 
but the point is that it has to be transparent. It has to be open source and it should not, it should not be default in our opinion. The concept of net neutrality um, because, you know, websites like Minds are really powerful in continuing the conversation outside the, the, the confined spaces of, of Facebook, for example, but net neutrality is how you get to a place like Minds. Talk about how you, have you been, been uh, engaged in the net neutrality fight? And if net neutrality is killed, how will that affect uh, your work? Yeah, I mean, putting fast lanes on the internet for these top companies is is definitely a risk. I can't live too much in fear. Uh, we we fight it. I mean, we you know support all the initiatives for net neutrality. You know, at the end of the day, policymakers are going to do what they do, and all that we can do is create open source tools so that and decentralized tools so that. If ISPs or policymakers change the playing field, then you know there's no centralized authority. So that decentralization is actually a key aspect of what we're doing and where we're going. I mean, anyone can actually start their own social network with Minds. It's not just Minds.com. You can actually take our code, start your own app, put it on your own servers, put it anywhere in the world for your own company, you can use it. You can make money off of it. You can do whatever you want with it. It's not just about us. The decentralized social networks are, you know, they have a ways to go before they're competitive functionally with something like YouTube, Google, Facebook, Twitter, but it's sort of, it's, it's definitely moving in that direction. So that would be a, a way to combat uh, whatever happens with net neutrality. If they change the playing field, you change the game. It's important to mention what's happening in the media in regards to alternative social networks right now. Obviously, the censorship happening on mainstream networks is causing these others to pop up. And some of them have attracted a pretty strong right-wing audience. I don't know if you've heard of some of these other networks. It is, in my opinion, essential to confront these problems head on as opposed to banning and censoring. So if it's legal in the U.S. and people aren't breaking the terms, then we allow it to exist. So mine says that it allows anything that is permissible by the U.S. government. And then the question then becomes... Why does a social media site align itself with um, the same laws as the U.S. government does? Because the, a government should obviously have as open laws regarding free speech as possible. Yet a social media site is a very concentrated piece of um, of society. So why should that mirror the U.S. government laws that are much more broad? Well, we're a U.S. company, so you know that's the main reason. But I mean, what it, it seems that the Constitution is the most rational policy to align ourselves with. I mean, what, what else is there, really? Well, I mean, I, I also think that the, the Constitution was written a long time ago by a bunch of old white men. So I think that there's, there should be some uh, avoidance of the political atom that... Um, that we can fall into by trusting that something that was written so long ago by people that don't live in this place in time, obviously they had no idea what social media was. Yeah, no, I, I understand that. I mean, I think that part of the, um, part of the difficulty of this whole landscape is that, you know, which do you choose? Do you choose to just sort of go ban happy and every time you see something that resembles hate speech, ban it? Or do you try to create more of an open discourse? I personally don't think that bad ideas can get changed by, by banning them. I just, I, I think that it's tempting to want to do that, to you know, protect people in the short term from being exposed to those types of irrational thoughts. But, you know, if you're really trying to get down to uh, systemic corruption and, um, you know, these, these racist uh, ideas, I, I don't see an actual better way to weed them out.
you can't get rid of those ideas. It is not possible. Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, you think that white supremacists and or racists from any race are not hanging out on mainstream social media sites? It, they're well, yeah, they're everywhere. I'm, I'm not you, saying you can that try they're... To- I'm not saying that they're not. Um, I'm just talking to you about your social media site because Zuckerberg never returned my phone calls. Um, but uh, Mine either. <laughs> I don't think that people should be banned for saying that, you know, oh, we shouldn't pay taxes. Like, it's not a matter of banning ideas that aren't yours. It's about banning ideas, from banning speech from people who think that certain collections of people don't have a right to exist. Yeah, I mean, I understand that argument, but I, I think it's just a, I, I, I think they're mentally ill. So, wow. you know, if, if, if but then it's how, sort if, of, if they are, if they are mentally ill, then how can you reason with them? Because you can't reason with somebody who's mentally ill. It's, it's a matter of rehabilitation. And how do people get rehabilitated online? Because online, I've never seen people win an argument online. I mean, I wouldn't say never. I mean, I understand that most online discussions sort of end in madness, but I know personally that I've learned, I mean, I my consciousness have been shaped in a large part from the internet. I mean, I've learned so much. My ideas have completely changed about different topics. So, I mean, I think that, yeah, certain people are stubborn and maybe temporarily unwilling to change, but, you know, if you keep you keep going at it i I honestly i I don't even people who deny being willing to change i think eventually will will have to change um so look i i I loved i want to continue this discussion because it would be great to you know look at our specific policy with you and you know the within the u.s law let's look at let's look at the things that uh you know, sh- should potentially be banned within there. I mean, our, our policy is actually also open source. So we are open, it's always open to commentary, it's on GitHub. Um, we think that the community should be commenting on our policy. I don't consider our policy a, uh, you know, document set in stone. I think that the community should also be evolving that as well. Next week, we will be diving into net neutrality again. But for those of you who want a head start on the action, visit battleforthenet.com and have your phones at the ready. And that will do it for this week's Dose of Dissent. Thank you so much for watching. Please spread and share this with all of your friends, foes, and people you don't know. Check out the last slide and the show description to see sites mentioned in this week's show. And for interim updates, visit us on Mastodon, Minds, Facebook, and Twitter. From the the Devil's Den, good night and act out. And real quick, to keep independent, non-corporatized media like this show going, donate at Occupy.com slash donate. If you'd like to donate directly to act out, visit Patreon.com slash act out. I'm not a violent man, but I